Le let's see whether we can entertain you for the last one and a half hour and um, because the topic now is regulatory submissions of clinical trials and uh, actually this is all what pharma is all about in the end we heard a lot about internal decision making and so but in the end what counts and what our uh, open source uh, products are needed for is acceptance for regulators, acceptance for submissions. So we'll see what the colleagues have to say. Thomas, you will start in telling uh, us about the R submission working group. So let's talk about the future of regulatory submissions. And the first thing I want you to do is basically forget anything you know about how a submission is done now. I think that's difficult for some of you because I see very experienced people out, out here. But do that for a moment and just think about some characteristics which in quote unquote ideal submission should have in the future. So in preparation for this talk, I thought about this and there's certainly lots of stuff that came into my mind, but there were in particular three points that I thought we're worthwhile talking about here. The first one being that whatever you submit to a health authority to get a drug approved that affects the life of people with a disease, the analysis should be fully reproducible. So that means any code you submit um, for any analysis data set, any table, any statistical model you fit, you need to be able to have that person on the other side ba basically reproduce exactly what you submitted. Then I think it really should be based on open source technologies. I really believe that if you perform an analysis on something as crucial as a medicine for a patient, um, there should be transparency behind the tools that you used. You should be able to scrutinize the methods that are implemented and really only open source software allows you to do that because you can look under the hood, so to speak, and actually see how certain stuff is implemented. And I really think that this idea of open science, open data, open source is really very valuable um, and what we should strive for. And finally, I really do think that we should um, incorporate interactive capabilities um, to allow that the reviewer actually has a much, much easier time because if you think about how submissions are done right now, it's basically digital paper and a lot of it. So you have hundreds or thousands of PDF documents with tables that I still wonder how people can even look at them. If you think of an adverse event table in a phase three trial, there may be hundreds of pages and then you repeat that for different subgroups, maybe only serious adverse events and you have the next hundred pages plus and so on and so forth. So I can only imagine that that's a nightmare to look at. Then of course right now, for the most part really rely on a proprietary language um, and I do um, take a stance that we should move away from that. Also, the code that we actually submit, while readable, at least if you do it to the FDA, is for the most part not actually executable. So going back to that piece of reproducibility, of course, that's then not given. Um, and overall, I would say that right now what we do for the most part is very bulky, inflexible, and non-reproducible. And that really brings up the question, can we do better? And I definitely think we can. And fortunately enough, there are other people in the industry who think we can and they formed a working group as part of the R consortium, um, which is the R submissions working group, which I want to talk about here. So the R consortium overall dedicated to basically open source and R in particular. Um, and inside this working group, we really have a broad representation from across the industry. So it's not a single company, it's multiple large sponsor companies, um, service provider in the space, and very, very importantly and crucially, 
um, we have direct interactions with the regulators themselves, um, at least with the FDA. Um, and that is really crucial for a successful endeavor where you want to change how you actually submit the data to basically that agency. So this working group has been around for some time and they are working on pilot submissions to actually showcase that yes, you can use open source tools, you can use R to submit a package to the FDA. And in particular, there have been um, so far four. The first one um, around submitting tables, listings and figures um, created in R. There is one around submitting shiny applications to the FDA. We have one which focuses on analysis data sets being created in R. And then finally, we have one um, that revolves around the use of containers. So get, getting back to that piece of reproducibility, really a crucial piece. So I will briefly highlight um, all of those and then I can hope later on in the panel discussion we can dive deeper into some of them. So the first one was related around the TFLs. Um, so just basically switching from SAS to R as an open source language, packaging them up, submitting it via the ECDT portal to the FDA and having them review that. And that happened in late um, 2019. Um, we got some feedback back as part of the working group. We made some adjustments, nothing major to be honest. Um, and it was a successful first pilot. So in many ways that was groundbreaking because for the first time actually we made it to use open source tools. But on the other hand, if you think about it, we still submitted digital paper. So not too interesting in that sense. This changed though with the pilot submission number two where actually um, a shiny application was built um, which basically encapsulated the same analyses that were done in the pilot submission one, but packaged them up in such an interactive um, web application. And I will just very briefly, because 10 minutes is quite short, um, showcase this application. Let's see if I can reload it here. So um, we heard earlier about Teal. So actually this is built using the Teal framework. Um, you can see we have some app information here, a user guide for the reviewer, kind of um, explaining them what is actually part of the app, what are the filters you can use. And then we have some modules which are, um, unfortunately again, I would say sort of digital paper because as you can see, this is just basically the demographic table without any interactivity put into it. On the other hand, we have for example here the Kaplan-Meier plot where you actually have the ability to um, filter for subgroups so you could, for example, say, I'm only interested in the female patients here, um, filter out the males, and then kind of see what is going on there. Um, so this um, is somewhat still ongoing effort, and there actually have already been two submission rounds, um, and there was interesting feedback, which we can go into in the discussion, but one crucial piece of feedback was basically, if you allow that much exploratory analyses and you display measures of statistical inference on something like Kaplan-Meier plot, that was a big no-go for the agency. So we sort of took that part out and um, that's why you don't see any um, p-values, for example, on the plot there. So I mentioned there's also the pilot three. So um, taking also the analysis data sets and programming them in R and in a way expanding pilot one to be a complete submission done in R, at least in a traditional manner where you take SCTM data sets as sort of the source um, and then transform them using R into analysis data sets and then have R also spit out the final analyses. Um, that is ongoing right now. There is this pilot submission plan for I think one or two uh, months time and we will hear some feedback uh, in due time. And then finally, what I think is particularly exciting is this um, pilot around containers. Because what you need to know for pilot two is the way that they shared the Shiny app, even though I showed that to you in a web browser, they only did that to kind of show the world what we did. But actually they submitted the app.r file via the ECDT portal. So, um, and then there were huge um, installation instructions in the analysis reviewers guide. So again, kind of a nightmare to actually set up. And of course, containers are this nice solution where you can not only package up the code that you have, the particular R version, the particular package versions, but even sort of an operating system um, that you can run and that allows you to more or less 100% reproduce whatever you have done on the developer side on the side of the end user. Um, and so we used something called, well, I should not say we because I was not involved in that, I'm just talking about it, but um, the particular members of the working group used a tool called Podman. So if you are familiar with Docker, Podman is same but different, um, and there are some subtleties about the open source license around that, which is why this was chosen. Um, 
and the Epsilon company, which we've heard of before today, I think Andre did a nice talk, and there we have some, exactly, um, are uh, involved in that, which I think is very great to see. So I'm really, really excited to see that, because then we actually get to a point where we do have reproducible analyses, and I think that's really what we should demand um, from um, our analyses and submissions. So how do you stay up to date with these developments? Obviously, you can um, listen to a talk like this here, um, but really in the spirit of kind of open source uh, and the openness around this, um, anything that this working group does is um, freely available online. You can browse the meeting minutes. Um, you can watch the Zoom calls, which are happening monthly. If you want to join them, they're free to, um, everyone's free to participate in them. So it's really around openness and transparency around what is going on. So if this caught your attention, um, definitely reach out and join this working group. And that brings me to the final um, slide. So how far is that future that I kind of mapped out um, away right now? Um, I think we still have some way to go, uh, but we're definitely heading in the right direction. And while there still be probably some um, you know, roadblocks along the way which we have to navigate around, I think if we stay on that course, um, I do really foresee a bright future for us. Will that take a year or two? Probably not, because you know we're probably not the most um, fast-moving industry, but at least we're heading in the right direction, um, and that's really what counts, in my opinion. And with that being said, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Thomas. Very interesting, very enlightening. So the next in line is uh, Davide Garolini from Roche on the TLG catalog, where TLG table listings and graphs, so we are diving deep Deep one more level. So I'm Davide, um, sorry for the gap. I will present to you the TLG catalog and uh, how Nest, which is uh, the project that um, um, manages this, all of this, uh, facilitates regulatory submissions. Um, I showed, um, uh, I, want to show, I wanted to show you in the first slide a table, an example table. This is called FCG01 and uh, the, it's a subgroup analysis of best overall response. And you can see that there is uh, alteration, um, confidence interval, and uh, a nice uh, uh, bar plot. This is uh, just an example of a static table, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's, um, it's an example that, um, of uh, one table, of the table listings and graph catalog. Um, <coughs> This is not working. That's the wrong one. That's okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I can use the arrows. <laughs> um, yeah, so what is it? It's a vast catalog of TLG templates that are ready made and very easy to copy and paste and adapt. Thank you. So um, I will show you directly a video of me. Uh, it's a video recording of me going on the website. Um, and here you can see that uh, this is the introduction. You can see all the tables. So you have adverse events. Uh, for example, this is uh, the number three. Um, this is the output. Then you have uh, efficacy, lab results. And all of these codes are actually internals uh, from Roche. And this is all open source. I uh, will talk about it later. Yeah, we have listings with pharmacokinetic, uh, other 
that uh, it's a mix. Then we have graphs, um, <coughs> where there is also our graph. And you can see that uh, this is the data setup. Then there is the standard plot. And you can open the code, just copy it, and run it on your machine. This is as simple as that. Then you have a reaction. You can, uh, if you sign in, sign in, of course. <laughs> you can comment. You can have, a, you can contact us on Slack. You can search for your table, for example, COXT01 uh, in this case. And, and you have, again, a, I mean, in this case, you have a small introduction. You can change the color. And you have uh, the reactions and so on. This is just a very fast show <laughs> showcase of it. Um, and I have another one, <laughs> if you like the first one. This is a uh, biomarker catalog which is recently uh, went to open source and is mainly managed by uh, Daniel here. Um, again, I did something similar so I can show you tables. Um, these are, of course, are biomarker related ones like DT2A. Uh, there is a bit more description of um, the table itself and um, the table itself. Then you have um, other various tables. Um, graphs, and uh, here there is a very nice selection of graphs, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and you can see also a uh, couple of major plots that we talked about a lot. And again, you can see the code and copy it uh, to get the exactly that image. Um, of course, all of this is, um, is showed with a uh, um, synthetic data set. And um, um, yeah, that is also available. Um, this is showing you, sorry for the low resolution, it's, uh, it's very large, this screen. Anyway, this is <laughs> showing you the stargazers of the project uh, repositories. And you can see that uh, the project started like more than four years ago. And um, at the beginning it was mainly our tables, which is a tabulation engine. Um, then uh, all the TL, TL packages families arrived. The TLG got uh, larger and larger and more people are uh, looking at, uh, let's say, following the repositories. Also, on um, internally in in Rush, we have more than 250 daily users so far, and of which uh, a relatively large part is uh, using uh, the the Nest family of packages. So here I I show you some of the main motivation why this facilitates regulatory submissions. So. First of all, it's a long and stable project. We uh, heard a lot of uh, many projects that uh, are fairly recent. So this is uh, is uh, almost four years, I think, maybe more, of active internal development. So it was made for Roche internally, and all the tags are for Roche internally, and it's open source, right? And we are talking about 40 developers working on these uh, various packages. It's daily vali validated. I added this. Uh, uh, before, <laughs> just uh, I, I have a, <laughs> um, it's a hint for the discussion afterwards, and um, it's daily validated in a state of art kind of uh, a software way. So it's unit testing, Docker, CI, CD, everything, and all the 50 packages are daily tested and validated on all, on uh, Docker images uh, twice per day, and we have always the notification like, and there is a bug. <laughs> Let's go and check. Then, of course, it's tailored for clinical trials, um, and it's an open source effort. And here I want to uh, also highlight that um, we are aiming to have an end-to-end -end fully R-based TLG filing this year, so from raw data to tables to listings to graphs, which is, will be a major achievement. Um, why going open source is so important? We talked extensively about this. <laughs> There was also a large discussion, but I want to reiterate uh, what we really uh, think it's important. Uh, it's that we have a larger impact because we also gather uh, academia, which would be uh, left out. And we know that uh, um, we all know the um, creativity that comes from academia. And uh, someone said time, <laughs> but uh, I will not uh, dwell on the discussion time versus money. Um, and then it's welcomed by regulators because it's something open. I mean, in, <coughs> with the number of users, uh, there is reliability, there is reproducibility. Um, in general, we, get, we want to get a faster approval. So collaboration accelerates industry towards standardization, which is the main goal for everyone. 
so have a less uh, long PDFs and these kind of things in any way possible to have a really to get there before. Um, because it's a matter of money and time. <laughs> anyway, um, we are doing at the moment also a Falcon uh, called the Falcon project, which is um, uh, focused on FDA standard templates and it's available open source. And I think it's in collaboration with BI, Sanafi and Moderna. And I think you will talk uh, briefly about it, maybe. Um, and, um, but the general message of, uh, of this, uh, it's um, we have uh, hundreds of templates that are already available for you to try. And you just copy paste, uh, use it for your case scenario, for your templates, and invest in collaborating with us. Because um, we made the first big step because we went open source, right? Which is not non-trivial at all. And uh, I think um, any kind of um, collaboration would be very valuable. So documentation, special cases, template extensions, of course, and backspotting are very welcome. Uh, these are like the, um, the X, I mean, three are the X stickers of, uh, of three of the main packages. You can see Teal that was presented um, today. And uh, you can access the TLG catalog from the QR code if you want. We are uh, available on the Slack channel um, of all the packages, so you can find the uh, teal, turn, our listings. And um, then, of course, we are very, very active on GitHub. I personally tag every question that comes along, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and we have uh, usually, like, uh, I think uh, between five and 10 issues per day filed, um, mainly by us, but, uh, you know, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But uh, it means that it's really, <laughs> it's really um, active, let's say. And we are here. So uh, later I will uh, show a demo. Uh, and um, if, you, if you want to see, I mean, I didn't prepare anything for the demo. So we will go with, uh, with the flow. That was my plan. So <laughs> come and ask. Uh, I'm mainly working with our tables, with the tables. So this, um, let's say, static outputs. Um, but. Um, but I can also show you TL if you're interested. I mean, it's, uh, it's part of the deal. Yeah, thank you for for your attention. Thank you, Very impressive. Uh, maybe I add one personal comment. Two years ago, when I was uh, still at BI, heading the stats department, we had an evaluation of the TLG catalog, uh, and uh, two colleagues of us who were two colleagues of us who were new, were able, were didn't know uh, the program, nothing, uh, were able within, f I think, not even four weeks to reproduce a BI report, so reproduce the TLGs of a BI report using the TLG catalog from Roche. I mean, this is rather, we were really surprised by how easy it was for us to reproduce what we have done internally with their program. So, so thanks again for that great work. So last in line is uh, my former colleague Stefan, uh, who tells us about challenges and opportunities of implementing R for regulatory submissions at BI. Stefan, please. Thank you, Ansio. So, uh, small correction, which I was given by my management, we are not a mid-sized pharma company. <laughs> 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 we are a bit, little bit bigger, but I wanted to say we are not the biggest fish in the pond. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what I want to um, um, give is a little bit of an overview talk. So uh, it probably makes sense that I have the last talk because I can now reference to many to um, discussions of today. And I want to uh, a little bit um, discuss why it makes sense for us um, to consider open source and R for regulatory submissions um, that we are on this journey. And I want to discuss the um, challenges and opportunities that we have along the way and uh, yeah. So disclaimer, uh, of course, it's really my opinion, not really that of the company. And um, so let's maybe quickly revisit why we think now is a good time to actually do this. 
And I think, uh, as mentioned, uh, some some things were already discussed, like you know the the talent tends to know um, more open source tools and R, Python, maybe Julia upcoming nowadays than than SAS. That's one motivation. Uh, lever leverage in open source is more cost efficient. So that's I guess not a fact. That's more an assumption. I think that. Um, um, relates a little bit back to, okay, what can we at the end of the day leverage from open source? Is it, for example, just the software or is the validated software and so on? So this is a rather assumption that, you know, um, depending on how you play it, it can be more true or less true, I guess. Um, and then also already discussed, um, so this, this sh should be, um, in the future, um, the, the R ecosystem in particular should enable new ways of working where you can, could imagine you have this exploratory, um, dynamic, interactive um, start where you explore the data and then you can bring this over into your clinical reporting workflow and um, prepare it for, for the reporting part. And then there are maybe more recent developments where I would maybe um, spend uh, some more seconds. So there's the Computer Software Assurance Initiative by the FDA, which is currently in a draft, as I understood. So this is um, somehow complementing the computerized systems validation guideline. So this um, is very new, um, but also very interesting. Um, what the FDA here basically says is we want the industry f to focus more on testing and less on documentation, which is very interesting. Um, they also offer new or suggest new ways of testing, going from you know um, the the scripted testing that we do nowadays. Maybe also to look into other approaches like unscripted um, exploratory testing. And I feel there is an opportunity for open source where you could imagine that this is maybe crowdsourced, uh, that everybody, every company maybe contributes. Um, um, their, their test results when they use it in clinical trials. And there's maybe also mentioned today there could be nice synergies with large language models and open source for the simple fact that these are driven by data and compute and open, data, uh, open source is, means more data than closed source. So this might just work better. Um, also um, already, I think, um, all touched on, um, BI is involved in a couple of initiatives. One is the Falcon Initiative, um, where we want to learn how to develop software that is uh, fit for purpose in the GXP um, environment. Um, so uh, we do this with the Falcon Initiative. And then um, as Hans Jürgen just mentioned, we did this, this mock reporting as exercise with, with the turn packages to see how, how close the reporting standards of, in this case, open source Roche's efforts and our own are. And we are quite substantially involved into the um, R validation hub with the regulatory R repo working group that was uh, introduced by Colleen this morning. Okay, so now maybe going into four areas that um, we currently work on where we see potential, but also some challenges. So I think at the end of the day, it would make a lot of sense to have an end-to-end -end clinical reporting pipeline. Let's see where we are now. Um, we, we have a world with multiple systems, multiple tools, programming languages, SQL, SAS, other things. Um, and this has the potential like we go to, to one ecosystem, to, to one modular system where you have one programming language now, if you think now, um, about agile teams and so on with T-shapes, that would allow that you have maybe one language, one common language, and you can maybe uh, work much more effectively. So challenges that we see is not everything is available yet. We see sometimes that you know, there is a focus to publish um, R packages, not entire products. Um, so the focus is on our packages and they, we, we might not see the entire product that can be used. And uh, the opportunity has said we can go to one unified tool stack. The development of a clinical reporting system 
So this is a quite, you know, this is a big topic. So I, I just mentioned a couple of, of um, subtopics here. Audit trail version control, um, QC process. Currently we are SAS centric as, as uh, I guess everybody else almost. Um, and, and this is our, our current solution is built around the core business process, clearly to try reporting. It's a lot of technical depth attached to the system. It's very difficult to change. It's built around company specific requirements for version control and QC. We developed over many, many years. And now we want to go, you know, we want to leverage open source. We go to more generic tools. And this brings then, of course, the, the challenge again, you know, this, these tools are mighty and powerful, but they are also more complex. How do you sell this to, to um, 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 users that are, you know, just um, used to more, much more simpler things? Um, and then also the question again, um, if it's not the R package, if it's a reporting system is much more else than R pa packages, um, but it might be still uh, pre-competitive, you know, where are the opportunities here to actually also share resources and maybe work together? Um, yeah, and the, um, our, uh, um, the regulatory our working group is maybe going tiny steps in that direction with um, supplying um, Docker images. Um, yeah, so, so this may be a good area. Multiple use programs. Um, we go from SAS as uh, used as is and trusted, and we, we do um, development together with a vendor uh, for, I would say, very low complex or reasonably low complex SAS macros that we let develop by the uh, vendor. The ven vendor validates that to a certain degree and we validate it again, just for good measure, you know. Um, um, two, okay, we want to actually to leverage our packages from multiple sources of unknown, um, un unknown quality for clinical reporting. Um, we want to be a, a developer ourselves. We want to contribute to our ecosystem. And this needs to spend over the whole life cycle of software development, not just software development itself, including validation. That's very important. And then this was also then the challenge um, mentioned multiple times today. I think we, when we think about validation, we think about GAM5 often good automatic manufacturing practice, which is a standard for computerized systems validation, not a standard for the validation of our packages, which is software. And we, we lack here a, a standard that would fulfill that. And it's a little bit overkill. There again, uh, the, the mentioned computer software assurance uh, might offer some good glimpse. Data analysis programs, we go from a world where the analyst is now responsible for the, mostly responsible for the output generation quality control in the future. They also have to think about, well, this R package that I use here, um, which risk does it have? Which, how do I mitigate that risk if it comes from an external source? So the challenge is here, how does this change the responsibility and the workload? The opportunity is then, like if you think about regulatory R repo, Again, um, can we automate this work a little bit? Can we, you know, um, provide already validation determination so that this is not so complicated? And then last not, but not least, so um, what is um, open source to us? Um, some were worried that this is, you know, a little bit like you know, Thorvalds um, who, who decides what goes in, and what doesn't go in, is that open source? And for, to us, it's a little bit, you know, um, that we want to shape and accept standards. That's what it is at the end. And this has many layers, I feel, that the regulators, where this is easy, right? They uh, give us the user requirements and you can just implement those. Uh, examples are um, the FDA's uh, standard safety tables and figures that were mentioned. And then we have this industry um, working groups where we need to see when, when we talk about standards, how this unfolds, right? Is there, can we really settle on a standard? because we, we saw already with validation, there are, a lot of uh, um, um, there are a lot of opinions on what this should entail and what doesn't. Um, is this then may, maybe more like a sharing platform? Let's see. And then for the company to understand where should we open source and where should we develop our, our stuff and maybe open source it. And the employee level means change management, learning new things, upskill, accept standards. So that's, 
my take on all this. I hope that that helps from a high level to understand what challenges we face and maybe if there's a way to collaborate and, 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 and work on things together that are maybe outside of the, the current scope of, of collaboration, that is maybe opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. There, there, there's one, one thing I completely disagree with you, Ooh. and that is you should not use the word standard. The word standard in pharma is really burned. Maybe use harmonization, but never standard. We all have made so bad experience with that term. Um, Daniel has asked me to give, uh, to provide also some, my, my perspective. I'm a little bit an outlier here because I have been a manager for 25 years. Now I'm on my own. And just I decided to very, very briefly, which this I have to take. Um, so a, a very different perspective uh, 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 on this whole endeavor. A and that is... Uh what would be convincing, I, I think it's very important. Uh, this is, most of you, I, I think, have a practical experience in SAS, uh, in SAS and in R. R. I personally have never programmed R. I'm a manager, 25 years, now I'm on my own. And I think it's very important to ask yourself, in order to make this change happen, what would be convincing for pharma manager, starts product managers and higher up to evaluate open source R software as an alternative to, yes, and let's acknowledge it. For more than 30 years, we used SAS, a proprietary software, and it works and it's highly performant. Let's acknowledge this. So, so, so what would be convincing evidence? So I, I think, and this is very personal, I think forget cost savings. This is not important. Forget fancy technical and statistical features. We have seen for years and years presentation at conferences about nice procedures being in Stardust, SAS, S+, whatsoever. That's not really re relevant for managers. What is relevant for the for management and company perspective? I believe the key point first is regulatory compliance. This is number one. Really, without this, everything else is not is not. You don't want to. You want don't want to risk a 100 to 200 million thr million trial with non-compliant analysis software. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, what is important is we also know in the past the FDA the FDA um, uh, staff was uh, every company was saying, well, we use. East, we use SAS, we use, or FDA uses East, FDA uses SAS. So, so this is standard for each and every statistical software. So what I'm saying, it, it makes a big difference whether FDA accepts open source or FDA supports open source. And if you can, can manage to get them on board and support it, that's a big difference. The other thing is long-term productivity, sustainability, and business security. Uh, if you switch from something which works to something, you, it may work, but will it work in 10 years? Is your 500-person organization, will th this 500-person organization have a product to work on which is still viable in 5, 10 years from now? That's the key question. And for that question, I believe this requires sh shared risk-taking and across industry harmonization. Uh, also, for, for me, uh, now comes to the really nice part, and if we are able, and I think you are quite close to that, integrating static tabular reporting with dynamic graphical exploration, for me, this is the holy grail. If we can, if we can achieve this, and if we can achieve it via a regulatory accepted GUI-based app, that's a real big step forward. That's a game changer. In order to get that game changer, from my perspective, again, risk shared risk taking and across industry harmonization. If each of the big companies develop their own teal, and, and there are some hints in this direction, then we are back to the time of SAS, then we are back to the time that the industry was developing their proprietary software as we did the last 30 years. So my view is, 
and, and this is what we should really discuss. So where do we go from here? What might help? I believe, yes, promote and publish collaboration. Promote this. Publish the experience with R-based submission. I have checked, I haven't seen any yet. If there is a company who has done a publication, a submission with R, they should publish it. This is so important. I haven't seen any so far. Then what is also important is if, if we have official public company commitments to R open source software. Mercedes one year ago or, or some months ago published one. Very, very powerful. If you get your managers to, to, to make really a strategic commitment to open source, that's convincing for the other managers from the other companies. There are also small steps. Um, you know, if you look at New England Journal, Lancet, uh, the primary publication of landmark trials, typically there is a statement, statistical analysis was done with SAS. If you have done it with R, make sure it's in. If you have done it with R packed, make sure it's in. This is important because this is public stuff which then can be used by other companies. Um, and, and also the last point um, for me is very important and I struggled myself to get this. Push your studs and Brock managers towards productive use cases for our open source. Productive use cases, that's the key point. People need to work on trials with that, not just in the sandbox, just real trials. And if you apply it and you can apply it to non-pivotal trials, you can combine our open source with your proprietary programs, the usual double programming stuff. Use SAS for the one, R for the other. So there are opportunities. And only if the colleagues work on it, it you will make progress. That's what I'm deeply convinced of. Yeah, and, and maybe the last point. Um, one year ago, we, we, managed, we managed to get a two hours conference just dedicated together with my colleagues here from Roche, we managed to get uh, a conference running just two hours. Uh, but it was dedicated specifically to managers. And it, it also specifically included managers. W we were targeting managers from big, big companies, small CROs, and academia and regulators. And it is really important that this is not a, a big industry topic, or this is very important to include academia. Push your managers to have more such meetings. I believe trust building between managers from big farmers, small farmers, CROs, academic and regulators, that's essential. I must say, I have also experienced very recently a one year collaboration among managers which was a complete disaster. A one-year collaboration on getting together a small number of companies on open source. It was a complete disaster. Why it was a complete disaster? Because there was no trust building. We didn't have kick-off meetings. We were not transparent with what was going on. So in the end, after one year, we just went and nothing happened, no result. Disaster. This should not happen. With that having said, let's, let's discuss. Please, the colleagues. A any questions? Marcel? Uh, thank you very much, very inspiring. Having worked on submissions, so I think this is really great what's coming. I have one question that looks a bit wider maybe. This is all within data sciences departments, right? It's basically doing our job better. But actually the, the submission requires medical writers, all of this, right? And I just wanted to know what's happening in the space of automated document generation like clinical study reports or the like because until the recent past uh, people still hand generated table copied numbers from uh, TLGs to the clinical study reports and the like so what's happening is anything happening in that space who wants to answer 
so when I was still at Roche, I think there were pilot projects going on of trying to automate some part of generating these um, kinds of things. And I think the approach that was taken was basically trying to extract some numbers out of outputs that were generated, which requires um, harmonization, um, which is not necessarily what people like to do. So I think that was a major burden. And now, um, you know, we have all these language models, which seem in many ways very powerful, which could be potential solutions for that. On the other way, we still double program every AE table, so I'm not sure we're ready yet to adopt these kinds of tools to automatically um, write stuff, but um, I would certainly like to see that. On the other hand, there are ongoing issues such as the open study builder, which takes an approach of saying, let's upfront with the end result in mind already define a rich set of metadata, which you can then reuse when you actually run the trial, and that sort of then you know, takes a broader perspective rather than just focusing on our pipeline of getting raw data to SCTM, to Atom, to outputs, and then stop. It kind of tries to kind of cover that all. Maybe if uh, I can. So uh, I have actually a meeting on Tuesday about this. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's a good question, I think. Um, and um, so there are two things to, to understand. There is one thing that is tabulation, right, engine. So you make the table. And that has to go through not only validation from a software perspective, so CICD, but also from a numeric perspective. So um, needs to be correct, right? <laughs> so your statistical tools needs to find the right results. And then, so this is one side. The other side is the visualization. So what do you do with this, um, this table, right? For the moment, we covered the first part. Yes, we covered the first part. Uh, with the TLG catalog, catalog open sourcing, blah, blah, blah. Um, the second part, uh, it's, um, I think, uh, could be automated. And I talked uh, with uh, medical writers, and uh, there is really a need of an automatic way. Of course, uh, you need to, to put it in the right place. And there is also the fact that you need to check what is in the table, right? You can't just push it in, and it's done, the document. So um, I think. Um, um, we need to be cautious about uh, automating that passage. At least uh, uh, we would need to, to check uh, truly this automation process. And uh, we had so many requests about this. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really, I don't think it's so complex as a task because it's really uh, exporting to another kind of file. So like for the moment we have a PDF. Uh, I think we are working also with, um, of course, HTML. Uh, txt so everything is um, is text based originally so it's machine uh, readable um, and also for that you can think that you can create your own packages to compare tables I think someone mentioned this uh, that uh, there wasn't so there was a question about comparing tables from different sources we are also trying to um, detach the statistical part of uh, of our tools uh, from the tabulation engine so you could play with uh, whatever you you like the most, GT summary, and you can play with rep tables. So um, I, I'm really on, on, on the side of uh, uh, risk assessment, so taking the risk together. Also in this automation thing, we know, I mean, um, I personally know there is a risk there <laughs> in automating this stuff. And um, I recognize this risk with Teal, actually. Because once we had, um, if I can tell a small story very fast, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had a small um, uh, retro, retro demo. So it's, uh, it's reverse demo. So in they, they are telling us how they use this stuff. And um, a girl asked um, uh, why they can't change a number, right, in the, in the table. Because at the end, in Teal, right, uh, uh, maybe you want to just change a name, or whatever, and you don't want to go to, through the whole process of renaming your 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 variable in the original table row, so on. And I thought about it uh, at the beginning. I said, "Yes, come on, it should be clickable, right?" But uh, no, <laughs> actually not. <laughs> I mean, because this is a huge risk for pacification, for um, yeah principally for physical <laughs> but also for errors, because people maybe change it, but it is not the right thing. Then you export it, and it's a mess to catch it later. Yeah. 
I think very good answer. Regulatory compliance is really the key. We should n not risk this. But on the other hand, the efficient workflow is also extremely important. And especially, I remember this morning, I don't know who it was who presented about the annual product review. So uh, I, I think that was very enlightening for me, that it's easy to, to combine uh, to combine results from different sources, databases, and to gen automatically generate reported reports. This should be easier in our case because R and R Shiny and the tools are the basis in contrast to what in production is happening. Any experience from someone here from the audience on, on, on workflows on this? If not, then different, please. Um, so I think it ties in with the question that you were posting, which is like, how do you convince the um, programming manager who's been in it 20 years to change what they're doing? You know, they, because they, and I know plenty of them, and I have this conversation with them, and they say, but it works. You know, we need to submit. Um, we've got a workflow that works, and I know it works because we've been doing it for all this time, and you want me to put all that at risk for something that I don't know if it works. Um, so I think for me, this change is um, really about that kind of... Um, you know, the accuracy, reproducibility, traceability being unquestionable is almost like a, a foundation. Um, and it's a hard thing to sell to somebody who's been doing it the same way for a long period of time. And, you know, um, it's, it's hard. And I think, I, I was just going to say, that the last thing that I'd have maybe a comment, I, my personal view is I think there needs to be a, a much, much more compelling answer, and I don't think I've got it yet, and I'd be interested to kind of group think here. I think there needs to be a much more compelling answer than, like, interactive plots. Thanks. Other questions? Um, so... My question is probably from, uh, comes from the East. We've been talking about discussing with FDA. How about Chinese authorities? Since it's a growing market, they have also specific requirements towards the submission. Not only that they need to be in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's, it has to be in Mandarin, or uh, if, probably if, if I'm not mistaken, but also how do they view those kind of, uh, approaches, because I know they are CDIS compliant and only CDIS compliant, but uh, how do we tackle this problem? I, I can comment on this referring to the status before COVID, which was a different world. Before COVID, the Chinese authorities was very open to learn from pharmaceutical companies, to learn from FDA, to learn from EMA, and they even invited, for example, I had also been invited to give a presentation how we in Global Pharma do statistical analysis. Yeah? So prior to COVID, they were very open. How it is now, I don't know. Maybe what, what, one, one other comment, I know also s two or three years ago, the Japanese authority made the move to say, we want, like the FDA, to reanalyze the data. Actually, I'm not aware of the current status, how far they have come to really analyze the data. But one thing I know, they will they request the data to be submitted in order to be prepared to, uh, to analyze. And I, I think the same arguments which were brought forward for open source would also, uh, to the FDA, would also apply to, to Japanese authorities. Uh, to Japanese authorities, sorry. Just a very quick comment because I was in Shanghai six weeks uh, in spring and 
I know there's a lot of community also building going on there. There was a big R conference similar like this, a similar amount of people, so it was very impressive. And, and they're still very much interested, I think, in learning from FDA and so on. So basically the message I remember is, let's first push FDA and email to do this and that they, they, they will follow. So um, that's still kind of the optimism that is there. So just, just a quick comment. Okay. Thanks. comment about the interactivity before, but I'm kind of interested to know the, the panel's opinion. So, like, the reviewer, they know what the trial was designed to do, they know what the protocol is, and I'm just kind of interested if there's any more information about why they don't want the reviewer to have an app that allows them to do lots of filtering and subgroup analysis and stuff. Like, are they not trusting the reviewer, or like, was there any indication of why that wasn't allowed? So I don't think they are opposed to the filtering per se. What they were particularly against is displaying, let's say the Kaplan-Meier plot, you have a log rank test and there's a p-value and they really didn't want that to be seen if you filter for a subgroup. Because to some extent, yes, they did not trust their clinical reviewers to be able to accurately interpret the information that is there because that's an ad hoc analysis that has not been protocol pre-specified. And I think in general, there is, if you submit such an application, you should not treat it in the same way as when you use it internally for exploratory purposes, but I think you can definitely, you know, implement all the subgroups you have specified in your protocol, for example, and be able to easily interactively um, drill down there, and instead of having to scroll pages of pages of your AE table, be able to say, hey, I want the system or in class these preferred terms, I want serious adverse events, boom, 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 click, I have it rather than, okay, where, where's the table? Scroll, 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 find the number, these kinds of things. Um, so I think it's just a different purpose because at the end of the day, um, any trial you submit is a confirmatory trial. So what is the, what is the, the task of the reviewer to confirm that the pro, uh, protocol pre-specified kind of endpoint has been met and that we authorize the drug? They're not in the business of telling us, hey, in this certain subgroup, there's an interesting signal, maybe you should run a second trial in there. I think that's a very interesting point. Um, uh, some, uh, m maybe, uh, Thomas, does that mean that the pilot was evaluated by statistician and not by the clinical, uh, the medical reviewers from the FDA? So the FD FDA me medical reviewers haven't seen the, the interactive app. No, I think they did. So the, this effort is led by the statistical department on okay. the FDA side, and they did engage with their clinical um, people. And I think out of that interaction, the feedback came um, that, you know, limit that to some extent what you can do in these applications. Don't just give them some the playground where they can do whatever they want. I, if we would have that message in a written form, it would be also a strong signal to our own colleagues? So, um, to be honest, I have not read this document recently, but f there have been two submissions so far, and each time the FDA has provided written feedback, which is available on a GitHub repository for the pilot too. So, um, I would encourage anyone who's interested yeah. to read that. Uh, just one, one other comment on this, and some of you may remember the rather strange, if not to say scandalous, approval of Aduhelm. Uh, and those of you who remember, uh, it is clear and it was even public that not only the FDA, the, the, the majority of the FDA advisory committee resigned after FDA approved Aduhelm, but it was also that the statistical, statistical reviewer of the FDA wrote uh, a review which was in sharp contrast to what the clinical and all the other reviewers said. So this is a situation within the FDA which came to public where the reviewers were it, it complete had a completely different view on the same submission. And I could imagine if we would uh, uh, supply the FDA with very powerful uh, interactive tools providing such exploratory testing and so on. In such a situation, it could even aggravate that difference, you see? Just as a second thought about it. O other questions? Uh, 
Just one comment uh, regarding what we were just talking about. Um, I'm really curious to know about the real interest of the FDA regarding providing interactive uh, application and so on. Because I mean, I mean, I've I've done quite few submission and and I'm really wondering for them how easy is it to to really explore the data using an interactive uh, uh, application rather than just sending an information request and asking us to provide the static report anyway. And I think it for them it's, I mean, we also have to step in, I mean, to to try to, 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 to yes, to look on the other side of the fence. Maybe it's so much easier for them to just ask what they are curious about. Anyway, they will, I mean, they will not work the extra hours in the weekend and maybe it's also easier for them to ask for static, static report or, I mean, I'm not saying they will not use uh, dynamic application to explore the data, but I'm really wondering if there is really a strong interest among the population of reviewers at FDA versus uh, CBER or CDER department. I, I, I believe, a personal comment, I, I believe uh, it will put additional pressure on the reviewers. Uh, however, if you think about uh, fast track compounds, the future may be and, and they have already, there are already cases where FDA subscribed to a kind of rolling submission. And if you think about this, this is all much easier and time saving uh, uh, and, and again trust building if we would provide the data with our analysis tools so they, they could reanalyze and apply it to subgroups or whatever. S so I agree with what you are saying. On the other hand, again, if we have a harmonized graphical interuser face and if we have harmonized tables, then the situation is very much different also for the reviewers because then you can train them right on the beginning on the same basic tools. So that would then be a real game changer. Again, a point industry should collaborate. It's a very good point, but don't you think that anyway, when we are in a frame of uh, art or this or breakthrough therapy, it's not, I mean, it's, it's usually easier because there is a strong uh, medical need and then, you know, usually it's much shorter CSR and, I mean. We, we will see how it, how it pans out, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe just a short comment. I think it's very well known that the statistical reviewers use, for example, JUMP, which is an interactive data analysis tool. So it does seem that there seems to be some need. So rather than them trying to fit our data, which is harmonized in some way, but we all know that there can be flavors of what an atom data set is, and make them to put that in their tool, isn't it much nicer to upfront say, here's the tool, you can already readily use it. If I can also add to this. Um, I think the end, I mean, I'm uh, fairly new to the clinical trials world, but I can, I mean, my intuition goes towards the idea that there will be both, because with uh, static um, tables, you have uh, really the, um, the result, so the output that must be exactly in that form and that, uh, in that re those results. But the exploratory aspects is more like uh, Let's see if we can find some errors, if some of the data is actually missing, you know. It's more like um, um, giving a creative way to, to review. I think it's a uh, it's, um, better weapon also for reviewer. As you said with this tool, I mean, I'm sure they're already doing it. The first thing you do with a new data set, you explore it. Right? And it's the same if you're a reviewer. You shouldn't have any assumption on the trustworthy of it. Thanks, thanks. Uh, we are three minutes above time. Is there any urgent question? If not, I... <laughs> oh, oh, there is one. <laughs> okay, <y> yes. <laughs> I want to ask a controversial question, maybe push back on things, <laughs> <laughs> just to finish it off. Um, I'm really excited about the cross-industry collaboration. I'm not so excited about the repeating the TFLs and producing these appendices to CSR that no one looks at. Um, Stefan, you're at a workshop with me in April, and an academic, uh, Martin Burrs, 
really explained how difficult it was to review these outputs in a DMC. I, I know Frank Bretz is up there. He has a similar experience working as an independent um, statistician in a DMC. What is the panel's view on this new standard, the analysis results standard from CDISC? It's essentially encapsulating results as a data set. Does that open up the possibility to throw away these useless tables, listings, and figures? If one of the panel members has a fast and convincing answer, <laughs> please come up now. If not, I think we have to postpone for the coffee break or for the apero. Anyone has a? I think it opens up possibilities because if it's, it is a harmonized format, that would enable to render it in any way you want. Whether, I mean, we're not there yet, right? We're baby steps. The standard isn't even out. So let's, let's see how it comes. But I, I think it's promising. Um, and let's go for coffee. Okay. <laughs> so big applause to the colleagues here. <laughs> Daniel, you want to say something for the apero? Just thanks for everyone for staying so long on a Friday afternoon. So I, I concur with, with that, uh, what Hans Jürgen said. So that, that's really great. Thanks to all the speakers and chairs. Uh, it was really fun um, to see all of this today. And now we have a lot of nice demos uh, you see there uh, upcoming. So please uh, have a look and enjoy the, the uproar. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>